Afternoon, guys. Dr. Ken Nardberg here again. White tails will. Uh, white tails have five stages of alarm, depending on what they see. You know, as far as hunters are concerned, uh, they, and once they got you signed stuff, which might be just take a split second, or might take 15 minutes before they decide. Uh, they'll do. They'll react in one of five ways, and it varies. Uh, according to how dangerous the situation might appear to the deer. Now, that's half the story. <laughs> Here's the other half. No matter how much you think you know about whitetails, or the whitetails where you hunt, they know a lot more about you. Uh, anywhere that you've hunted for two years or more, Every deer there that's two years of age or older will recognize you by your odors, by sounds associated with you, your voice, maybe the sound of your pickup or your ATV, or the sound of you cutting firewood in your camp, uh, all kinds of sounds. Uh, sound of your weather radio in the tent. <laughs> That's all you, those are you, those sounds. Now, you might think, you know, you've, you've probably read articles. I remember reading articles by really well-known writers in outdoor magazines who said whitetails have a lousy memory. They don't remember things longer than about a half hour. That is so untrue. <laughs> now, when I first started doing my research, I spent a lot of time in the woods, you know, off season, I have a lot more time during you know months you can't hunt whitetails than I did during the hunting season. A uh, lot, many, gee, weekend after weekend I'd go up there, and uh, those deer got to know me pretty well. In fact, there were two does, and I used them in a lot of our research. They made good research something. One uh, had really dark rims around its ears. I call that one the black-eared doe, and there was another one. I uh, had a red uh, scalp, and that was pure red. I called that the, the red, uh, the red-haired buck doe, uh, the red-headed doe, and that red-headed doe. Uh, my camp was always every year was the same spot. It was within that doe's home range, and she got she got so you know, used to me that she was always showing up around camp with her little fun. A little fawn would be real shy, and but she'd lead the fawn up around my camp. I never fed her or touched her. I talked to her, but uh, it got so that every year uh, when we go up and set up camp three days before the season began, and that doe would be there around the camp with her fawn. The fawn was getting to be really tame as well, and uh, guys coming in on this logging trail, it was about miles long. I'd drive by the camp, and every year the guys would stop and talk, and or people would stop and take pictures of this red, this the redhead, that, my, that red-headed doe in my camp. And they thought that was really amazing. Every year, here she'd be, and some years she had twins. And uh, the black ear doe wasn't; she didn't hang around my camp for people to see. But I, I could walk in the woods, walk right up almost right up to where she was bedded and she wouldn't even get out of her bed. She, she'd look at me and lie as if she was saying, oh, it's just you, you know. But she, she always remembered. Now, so those deer got to know me really well and I, and I knew it. But there was a lot of deer that got to know me really well as well that I didn't realize what it was happening. Uh, those two made it seem obvious, but I didn't think of other deer, like older bucks and other deer, uh, getting to know me really well as well, but they did. But here's another thing. You know, for 18 years, my wife Gina and I, we hook up our travel trailer, pick up, and we drive down, and we spent two and a half months every winter uh, in the, along the Mexican border, close to the Mexican border, and uh, well, in the Panhandle of Texas as well. But uh, 
We spent two and a half months traveling to spot to spot in uh, in uh, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, and uh, always looking for good places to photograph and uh, and study whitetails. And so we studied whitetails in the State Plains in the Panhandle, of Texas, and in uh, in southern southern New Mexico near in the area of the Florida Mountains, and uh, in uh, southwestern uh, Arizona in the, in the Sonoran Desert, and where Jack O'Connor, the famous gunner, grew up hunting uh, the whitetails there. They're called the cows variety, C-O-U-E-S. And uh, I always thought that was really great to be able to spend time studying whitetails, the whitetails that Jack O'Connor hunted when he was young. But, uh, Two and a half months for 18 years we spent time there. Well, in our favorite places where we did study whitetails, those deer got to know us really well. And my wife loved to make pets out of whitetails. <laughs> she, she was determined to feed them by hand, you know, give them names. And I know this, there was a, a bunch of whitetails, about a dozen of them, in Palo Duro Canyon in Texas. And she tamed, <laughs> you know, we could, we'd arrive there, you know, be gone for a whole year, come back, finally, here we are, get down in the Cal Palo, Palo Duro Canyon, and uh, one, you know, nice little remote section, and we backed the trailer into our favorite uh, campsite there, and while I'm hooking up, the sewer system and getting the water system going and all that stuff going. Gina would be out there calling deer that she had named. Uh, there at that particular campsite, she had named one deer Mama because in the early years we were there, she always had fawns. And she was kind of a jug-headed deer, kind of different looking than the others, long narrow head on her. And, uh, that, but she called her Mama. And that deer got so used to Jean calling her mama that every year, while I'm setting up the trailer, getting all the systems going, she'd be out to sing, Mama! And pretty soon, here she was with her latest funds. They, they remembered her voice. They remembered the sounds associated with me setting up the trailer and the sounds of the truck, sounds of us two talking to each other. Uh, and they'd hear that. And we treated them now. <laughs> we, we would give them a little pieces of apple. I'd cut apples and slices of apples and, and we'd give them apples, you know, and uh, and sometimes corn, you know, or dried corn, and put it in a little tray and put it on the ground. And oh, they love that. They probably never tasted apples or corn in their whole life until we came along. So maybe they were thinking more of that, of apples and corn, than, than us. You know, but they they always remembered us every year and so quickly. And the one deer, Gene, decided to call it Apple. And it, and it loved Apple so much, it, you know, it decided its name had to be Apple. And this is no ploy. This is no ploy. That deer was so smart. I remember one year, I hear it was, we had just gotten there and I was sending up the trailer and, and here comes Apple. And we always knew it was Apple. She had these almost white legs real different colors on it, light legs. Here comes, she'd be out there, Apple, and here she comes, Apple with her newest fawn. And while I was doing that, Jean asked me, well, why is Apple doing that? <laughs> Apple was standing there, and she's looking at Jean, you know. She, Jean, I kept telling, discouraging Jean, you know, you shouldn't feed them by hand. They get to be too vulnerable to other people who might not be kind to them, or get to be real easy to take by deer hunters. But anyway, I looked over to see what Apple was doing, and Apple would go, she was looking at us, she'd look at Jean, and then she'd look at the ground, and she'd look up in the air, and then she'd look at the ground, <laughs> and then she'd look at Jean, and <laughs> Right away, I thought, you know what she's doing? She's telling you she wants an apple. You know, when you give her an apple, you know, when you throw a little slice of apple up in the air and it drops down in front of her by her feet, 
That's what she's telling you to do. Throw the apple to her so it goes up there and comes down by her feet. So she not only remembered us, but she remembered all this whole thing about apples, and she figured out this was a good way to encourage us to give her apples right away. <laughs> and, and then a couple years later, one of her fonds was doing the same thing. And uh, so imagine that. That means Mama Apple taught her fawn how to do that. Now, that's something interesting too. But this is a bit so common of uh, whitetails and behavior. Whitetails, we had the deer in those three states every year, deer up in my study years, do the same thing. They would remember us and remember that we were harmless, so they didn't worry about us. And when they would hear Jean calling them with her soft female voice, they just come right to camp right away. Not only deer, we even had a turkey do that. The turkey named Annie, Jean named it Annie. And Annie would eat corn out of a cup with Gene holding the cup that Annie would come up pecking there. You know. And the reason that Gene had her do that is because Annie was at the bottom of that pecking order of about a dozen hens and two and two big toms. And they would be pecking at her, chasing her all the time, and poor little thing. So anyway, they have excellent memories. Well, yeah, here's another example of of a deer getting to know you really well. Oh, quite a few years ago, gee, a long time ago, I remember Gene and I would cruise the back roads in Wisconsin looking for deer on farmland. And uh, then where we would find some, you know, in the wintertime, a lot of times it was before or during or after a hunting season over there. And uh, snow on the ground, and, Binoculars were out there in the pickup looking for deer up on high ridges behind farms, things like that. And we found a spot. Gee, there was a bunch of bucks up there. And we went and we asked the farmer if it would be all right if we. He had it posted. It was posted land, a cornfield. And I said, Sure, uh, you know, lions are not going to be hunting. I said, Sure, go ahead. That's no problem. Said uh, you'll be lucky, you know, if you get any pictures. Says, those deer are really, you know, they are hard to get close to. And they were on this bluff up back of his farm. So we went up there, and sure enough, they were really hard to get used to. But I remember almost right away, the first time we got there, here comes a fawn. <laughs> it was running toward me, or it wasn't running, but it was moving kind of fast, walking real fast right toward me. And I had my camera out and I was trying to focus. Uh, that was back in the days uh, when you did all the adjusting yourself, you know, by hand on your cameras to take pictures. And I kept coming and I kept adjusting it to keep it in focus like this, you know. And then, well, then pretty soon it would look like this and it was right there in front of me and then he put his wet nose on my camera lens. And I never did get a picture of him doing that, but this fun. And he was a buck. He had little knobs on his forehead, little furry knobs, and that was best uh, 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 antlers he had that year. Well, when we go out, we are out in the field like that, Gene and I often carried snacks with us. And I was so taken with this little fun, he was standing there looking at me, and I had some potato chips bag of potato chips in my pocket. And I got that out and opened it up and he's standing there looking at me and I tossed a piece of potato well, a potato chip on the ground on the snow. And he sniffed it and then he took it in his mouth and chewed on it. And you could see his eyes like him, oh he really liked that potato chip. And that darn fawn followed me around all day. Well all the hours we were there. But we didn't get close to any big bucks that first trip. And uh, we went back there a couple times that winter and, and most of the pictures we got of any decent bucks were pretty far away, a good distance away. In fact, there was one big buck there. He had the darnest antlers. It wasn't until the third winter that we got close enough to get good pictures of him. And then he was 
just kind of being tolerant of us. He wouldn't run away or act alarmed. He, but he wouldn't be, you could talk to him, but he wouldn't even look at you. No, I don't have anything. I'm not going to talk to people. <laughs> he was almost like a pussycat, you know, ignoring people. But, uh, but it took three years of going back there. Now, the reason we were finally able to give it them because all those deer remembered us. And uh, during those three years, we, we found it was useful to bring potato chips along, you know. And, and a couple, of, and then we used to bring cobs of corn, you know, uh, uh, dried, you know, cobs of corn, bring them. And uh, we discovered to our horror one year that when they throw a cob of corn on the ground there, two bucks, if two bucks went at it at the same time and their antlers clicked together, they start fighting. And one time when the fight started, one of them got gored pretty badly in the throat. And I'm, oh my God, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't put corn out there like that. You know, we might make one deer kill another one. But one year I had with me, probably about the third year, I also had a bag of M&Ms with peanuts in. And, uh, of course, every year when we went, one of the first deer would that would show up when we so we wouldn't even have to call. Here comes that fawn. It was growing up to be a bigger buck, you know. And uh, but that didn't matter. You know, well, here they come. And, oh, I'm gonna get a potato chip. And I think he was thinking, you know. And they come right up to me, and he's looking at me. Well, where's my treats? Where's my treat? You know. And of course, younger bucks in here, and these bucks kind of have their own little buck society, there may be, there was all oh, about eight of them, I think, if I recall. I don't think there was a dozen. But wherever they were, where they bedded up there, the bucks all bedded in one spot, the does and all the younger deer were in another spot. They didn't ordinarily bed together. And, uh, but anyway, while this buck was doing that, the younger bucks would follow him, and they were learning from that buck that you could come up to this human here and he'd give you a treat. So we had several of them looking for treats, you know, by that time. Well, this one year I had the M&Ms. And uh, I had, had it, well, I took it out of my pocket and it, well, deer were all around us and Gene was way over there somewhere photographing deer. And, and uh, so I got out the M&Ms and threw a couple in my mouth and here comes that buck. And he was a ten-pointer by this time. And he comes up to me and, and uh, he's looking at me and it, I think he was wondering, well, what do those taste like? You know, like it smelled different, you know. So, well, so I threw a couple hand hands on the ground and, and he went over there and picked them up and he took a couple of chews. And it was like the first time when he was a fawn, when he first tasted a, a, a potato chip, his eyes lit up. Oh, he's like, just... Is that ever, do I ever like M&M's? <laughs> so, he, here is his 10-pointer fall. He's getting in the way sometimes when he get a picture and all of a sudden his 10-point rack is right in front of the camera. <laughs> so, anyway, I remember that year, uh, the next year we were going to go there. And, uh, you know, I was telling Gene, I said, you know, I, I've got an idea for a special picture. And, uh, uh, it's found in my sixth edition, and I, I went to Almanac, which is no longer available. By the way, I got a guy from said, "You know what your 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 old books are selling for on eBay?" And I said, "They're selling for a thousand dollars. All kinds of they want people want thousand for them." Well, anyway, so I, I so I, we set the picture. I right, well, I put on camo, blaze orange, hunting clothes. Brought my model '94 Winchester man with me. We went out there. I sat on a stump, put the Winchester leaning out against the tree next to him, and, and sat there with that book in my hands. But if, just be, about that point, now I'm all set. So I got out this bag of M&Ms and the crackling plastic. That buck, he heard that, you know, we just got there. Uh, and I got set up. He heard that crackling plastic with the M&Ms in it. And that's so all I was sitting there. And then, the caption at the bottom was, uh, let's, well, let's see now. 
I've done this and this and this. According to this book, I should soon see a big book. But <laughs> at that point, his head was right looking over my left shoulder. <laughs> Jean got the picture. In fact, she shot a, a bunch of them pictures, you know, different poses. But this one we really liked, there he's looking over. And according to this book, I should soon see a big buck. <laughs> and his head right there. But what he was looking for is M&M's. <laughs> you know, it's a, that's not the end of the story. One year, we were up there, and was, he was, next year he was big buck. And uh, unfortunately, there was a bigger one there. Uh, so he couldn't be the dominant breeding buck, but he certainly would qualify as one in just about any other place you could imagine. And uh, um, that, Gene, uh, we ran out of film. We were using film then, you know. It, and uh, so I had a bunch down in the truck, so I so I'll hike down and get some. And while I was down there, uh, that ten-pointer, it, it was always ten-pointer, the biggest, at most of that most times he had, he uh, was fighting with the big dominant buck. And uh, boy, when they were really going on, and Gene got all kinds of neat pictures of those two fighting. Best, best battle, battle between dominant, uh, big bucks uh, we ever got. And we have quite a few, but nothing like that one. Well, the ten-pointer lost the battle, and uh, well, he didn't get killed, you know, he didn't run away or anything, but he was wandering around there, and apparently he was really mad, you know, that he had lost. And then he spotted Jean, and he walked right up to her and put his head down and pressed his antlers against her chest. Now, at this point, Jean knew this was a really dangerous thing, you know, what, what was going on there. So she started talking to the buck softly with her voice, you know, her dear taming voice, and started backing away. One, you know, a lot of people, if this had happened to just about anybody else, when those antlers came and pressed against their chest, they would have pushed the antlers away, or grabbed one and pushed it, whatever. Which is, a, when, when two bucks can come together and they touch antlers, one pushing against the other, that's a challenge to battle, to do battle. And they go at it. You know, imagine the amount of power uh, a buck like that has. A buck that weighs, well, like one of our big dominant breeding bucks, weighs 305 pounds, can leap 25 feet, 8 feet up high in the air while doing it. Imagine this amount of power that would be behind a, would be behind a buck that pressing his antlers against your chest. And if you pushed him, then he'd really bore into you. I mean, he would. this would be all serious action from that point on. He would kill you. So she knew she was in that kind of danger. She knew she could not touch those antlers. So she just kept talking softly, her camera down at waist level, kept backing away. And that buck stayed with her for a while, pressing his antlers on him against her. Well, he wanted to battle. Oh, but she kept going. And, then, and even backed her into a barbed wire fence at one point, on one side of him. And, but she turned there and continued backing away. And finally, it didn't follow her. I finally let her go. And it, she said he looked real happy after that. <laughs> he was looking pretty grumpy before he did that, but after that he walked away like, boy, I just I just beat up a human or I won the battle of a human or I made a human back away and wouldn't, wouldn't battle me. So he felt pretty good about that. <laughs> so even a buck like that, who's almost a pet, can be very dangerous. Uh, uh, during the season that breeding is going on, or even afterwards, and uh, because they're very, they can be very aggressive, very dangerous under, you know, that kind of circumstances. But uh, yeah, I'll never forget that. Uh, she was, Jean was, pretty scared when I got back with the film and she told me what happened. <laughs> and 
but um, that was something. Well, John will put some photos of this event, and uh, maybe a picture of that big ten pointer when uh, he, he was he was big enough to be a dominant breeding buck. It was it was a nice buck, nice balance animals, good buck. And it was an experience I'll never forget. But there again, a really rich example of how deer get can get to know you really, really well. And being the bucks they are, they can get to know you really, really well without you ever knowing it. You know? Uh, they're so, so, you know, when they get to be older and they realize their camouflage is so good that they can just stand and cover or not even get out of bed when the sun goes by, sees this happening every day, the same hunter or other hunters for that matter, and they all smell differently and do act differently. And, but uh, you can imagine now, let's just say you're a guy, he keeps going back to this one stand year after year. Maybe he got a decent buck there one year. And so he keep wanting to go, he can't wait to go back and hope it, you get another one there eventually. Well, can you imagine what, how much that would mean to a big buck that does live in that vicinity? Uh, yeah, knowing that's where you're going to go and it's the trail you're going to use and how easy it'll be for that buck to stay away from you. You know, you could be out there a whole hunting season and be with a hundred yards of the women over and over again and never realize it unless you see the tracks, in fresh tracks in the snow, maybe on your tracks or uh, across in your trail when you're going back to deer camp or your car. But you, you, <laughs> Those deer where you hunt, where you hunted more than two years, they know you so well you can't believe it. <laughs> so you can't keep doing the same thing if you expect to take bucks like that. Yeah? What that means is all those older deer, especially the big bucks that you'd like to take, they know you that well. You may never see them, but they know you that well. They know what you smell like. They know what your trail scent smells like. They know the trails that you like to walk on. They know how you hunt. You know, you'll go down this trail, then you climb in that tree over there. They know that. And you wonder, how come you don't see big bucks there? Because they all know that's the way you hunt. You know, the, when I'm telling you you should be moving to new stand sites every day, or even every half day like we do it, that's the only way to stop this from happening. They might know all about me, those deer. Oh, but they even know I change stand sites every day or every half day. They know that. And it's me. And I'm the guy that comes down this trail. The only time I might catch them by surprise is opening morning. And I've gotten lots of big bucks on opening morning because they didn't expect this to be happening at that point. Or because it changed the stand site. All of a sudden I'm in a different place they, where they never expect me, a stand site I've never used before. You know, that's the only way you can out maneuver, <laughs> out fox those big bucks that know all about you, everything about you. A lot more than you can imagine. And they never forget. See? So you keep making the same mistake every year, you're a pushover to avoid. Nothing to it for those big bucks to avoid. You make it easy for them to see you in a stand site next to a food plot, you you just don't have a chance. Then once they do, well, then there you are guarding your food plot, you know, like like a like a eagle there that you don't want anybody else bothering this place here. You can't so why well, they just you can't hunt that way and expect to be taking with tour bucks every year. It just won't happen. Because they know you so well, every one of those deer. They're the reason they, you're thinking maybe there's only one buck per 12 does in that hunting area. When there's a normal number of bucks in there. Normal number of bucks three and a half years of age or older in there. But you're, you're no danger to them because you're so predictable and you make it really easy for them to identify it. So they don't have to resort to stage three, four, or five alarm while you're around. They might might be one or two, 
but you probably won't even realize it's happening when that happens. But, so now, you see, that's how deer react and why. But just imagine that. The buck you keep dreaming about, the buck you see on your trail cam, those bucks, they really know you so well. And how are you going to outfox one this year? Huh? Are you going to just sit there in the same place? Are you same, same food plot? Uh, the same water, the same trail? Or some spot you just, oh, I've got a picture of this big buck here, I'm going to sit here. Uh, if for no particular reason, except that's where you got the picture. That's not, not the best way to go about hunting for big bucks. So, that's something to think about, guys. You know, you don't want to believe it? No, no, you're, you're going to get one at your, at your food plot this year. Gee, yeah, you got all this stuff uh, guaranteed to make deer grow huge antlers and they can't resist it. Or this dual nest, this lure scent, or this new call I got. Yeah, no. <laughs> you would, eventually, you think about it when you're sitting out there, you guys. Think about what's happening or what isn't happening and why. Now, it has everything to do with, I've been talking, with what I've been talking about today. Okay? You think about it. And when you do, one day you're going you're gonna to think, you know, <laughs> I think Doc's right. I think I better start doing things a little differently. And when you do, you're going to kick yourself because you wish you'd done it years earlier. Well, with that, uh, I still will tell you, uh, uh, good luck this year. Uh, have, get a big one this year if you can, uh, and maybe you will, you know, if you try something like progressive stand hunting, that sort of thing. With that, uh, thanks, for, thanks for watching, and, and be, sure, be sure to, if you haven't done it already, to uh, a bit subscribe to my YouTube channel, and if you haven't gotten your book yet, you know, you know you're going to get it. You, you know, after watching me all these hours, and maybe all summer, <laughs> you know you're going to get your book. It's going to happen one of these days. So do that. And like, like I said so many times, you'll be really glad when you did. So with that, uh, thanks again, guys, and I'll see you soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.